Okay, let's unpack this. We're exploring pediatric burn resuscitation, and the numbers here are everything. This is information that is absolutely essential for any team managing acute burn injuries in kids. What exact patient threshold tells us we have to stop, pivot, and use the modified Brook approach? We initiate the modified Brook protocol for any child with burns exceeding 15% of their total body surface area. 15%? That is the non-negotiable threshold. Once you cross that 15% mark, this more uh, conservative strategy has to begin. So why 15%? Is that is that number set in stone or is there any debate about, you know, starting a bit earlier or later? In pediatrics, the standard is 15%. And the reason is it really balances the known high risk of a systemic inflammatory response, which happens with those larger burns, against the risk of, well, iatrogenic injury if we push fluids too aggressively into a smaller system. So it's a very established trigger point. It is. Widely accepted. Understood. Now let's talk strategy. If the traditional Parkland formula uses higher volumes, what's the specific advantage of the modified Brooks more conservative take? What are we fundamentally trying to avoid? Over resuscitation. That's it. We are fundamentally trying to avoid the complications of giving too much fluid. And in a child, that's even more dangerous. Oh, absolutely. The margin of error is tiny. Excess mm -hmm. fluid, it, it rapidly translates into some major physiologic problems, specifically pulmonary edema and increased intra-abdominal pressure. The modified Brook formula tackles this by deliberately targeting lower fluid volumes. The message seems clear then. In pediatrics, the risks of giving too much fluid, at least at the start, they often outweigh the risks of giving too little because their tolerance is just so low. Exactly. So let's get into the how. That conservative approach means we can't treat, say, a five-year-old and a teenager the same way. What is the standard fluid we always start with? The standardized fluid, regardless of the calculation rate, is always warmed Ringer's lactate solution. Always warmed? Always. Warming it is so important to help mitigate hypothermia risks, and Ringer's lactate is just the crystallated choice here for volume expansion. Okay, let's break down that calculation because this is where age brings in the first big numeric difference. What is the specific volume formula for the younger kids? Let's say 12 years old and under. For children aged 12 years or younger, the rate is 3 milliliters multiplied by the patient's weight in kilograms times the percent of total body surface area burned. So 3 milliliters per kilogram per percent. That's the defining calculation for this younger group. 3 milliliters. If children 12 and under get 3 milliliters, what's the adjustment for adolescents, patients 13 years and older? Patients age 13 and up, they transition to the lower rate. They require 2 milliliters per kilogram per percent. Me. Total body surface area. 2 milliliters. Yes. And this just recognizes that their physiology, their volume capacity, it's all starting to approach that of an adult. So that's our first big numeric split based on age. Three milliliters versus two. Now, once you've calculated that total 24-hour volume, how do you schedule the administration? The total calculated volume is split into two, um, two mandatory phases. Half of that total volume is given pretty rapidly in the first eight hours after the burn happened. The first eight hours and the rest of it. The other yeah. half. The remaining half is then administered over the next 16 hours. So a much slower rate. Exactly. The focus is on rapid initial volume replacement, you know, to get tissue perfusion back, followed by a sustained, more moderate rate to just maintain that stability. So beyond that calculated resuscitation fluid, we can't just forget about their basic metabolic needs. Let's talk maintenance fluids. Are these standard for all pediatric burn patients? No, not for all of them. But separate maintenance fluids are mandatory for certain pediatric patients. And this is another layer of complexity here. These fluids, they must contain dextrose. And why is that dextrose requirement so important here? Well, small children have very, very limited glycogen stores. Mm -hmm. The hypermetabolic state from a major burn just, it burns through those reserves incredibly fast. Oh, I see. So if you give a dextrose-free solution, something like straight ringer's lactate, you put them at a really high risk for profound hypoglycemia. And that would just destabilize an already unstable patient even more. So you have to include dextrose. Which fluids meet that requirement? What's acceptable? Acceptable examples would be uh, D5RL, that's dextrose 5% in Ringer's lactate, or D5NS, dextrose 5% in normal saline. The exact crispoloid might vary a bit, but that 5% dextrose component is essential. Okay, so who are these high-risk groups? What are the specific age and weight lines that tell you, yes, you must add these maintenance fluids? Maintenance fluids apply if the child is 12 years old or younger. Okay. Or if they weigh less than 30 kilograms. If a patient meets either of those criteria, you have to add the separate maintenance fluid. 
So it's an or, not an and. Correct. 12 or under, or less than 30 kilograms. And how do we calculate the volume for that separate fluid? What's the rule? The volume is determined using the standard calculation for basal fluid needs, which is the 4.2.1 rule. Let's just quickly clarify that for everyone listening. Can you just give us a quick reminder of what the 4.2.1 rule calculates? Certainly. It calculates the hourly maintenance rate. So it's 4 milliliters per kilogram of body weight for the first 10 kilograms, then 2 milliliters per kilogram for the next 10 kilograms, and then 1 milliliter per kilogram for every kilogram after that. And that gets added on top of the hourly resuscitation rate? For those smaller patients, yes. Okay, that's a lot of calculating, but it makes sense. So this is a very dynamic process. Meticulous monitoring must be involved. What is the single most fundamental tool for tracking if this is all working? It has to be the Foley catheter. Prompt insertion is essential. I mean, accurately and continuously tracking urine output is the absolute cornerstone of monitoring your endpoints. Without that data, you're flying blind. Completely. The whole huh. protocol fails without precise hourly urine output data. Let's get into the targets then, because these also change based on size. What's the target urine output for the smaller kids, those weighing 30 kilograms or less? For children weighing 30 kilograms or less, the target is one milliliter per kilogram per hour. One milliliter per kilogram per hour. Yes, which is a relatively high target. It reflects the goal for adequate renal perfusion in a smaller, very stressed system. And does that target change for the heavier children, the ones over 30 kilograms? It does, yes. The target is lowered significantly. For patients weighing more than 30 kilograms, the goal is 0 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour. 0 0.5. Correct. And that is the second really important numeric distinction based on weight. One milliliter per kilogram per hour versus half a milliliter per kilogram per hour. Hitting that target is what tells you your current resuscitation rate is working. That 30 kilogram threshold is a huge physiological pivot point. And maintaining those targets, it must require constant, tiny adjustments to the infusion rate. Constant. So beyond urine output, what other clinical markers do we need to be assessing frequently to get a picture of overall systemic perfusion? Well, you have to assess the patient's mentation their level of consciousness, their alertness. It's a quick, non-invasive indicator of how well their brain is being perfused. Right. Then, of course, you evaluate vital signs frequently. You're tracking heart rate, blood pressure trends, and very importantly, you monitor serial, serum lactate levels. Lactate? Why is that so telling? A high or a rising lactate gives you insight into persistent peripheral hypoperfusion. It's a sign that your current resuscitation might not be enough. Okay. So this continuous assessment feeds right back into your infusion rate. What is the policy on giving a routine fluid bolus in this protocol? The protocol is emphatic on this. You must avoid routine fluid boluses completely. Completely avoid them. Yes. Boluses just introduce uncontrolled volume. They directly defeat the whole conservative measured strategy of the modified Brook formula. They are not a standard part of this plan. So if routine boluses are forbidden, when is one permissible? What's the single justification for breaking that rule? Boluses should only be given if true clinical shock is clearly and uh, demonstrably evident. And what does shock evident mean in this context? We're talking about persistent hypotension, a severe change in mental status, or a sudden sharp drop in urine output that doesn't respond to a brief monitored increase in the current infusion rate. It has to be a specific emergent clinical decision not a reflex. So why is this meticulous continuous rate adjustment based on urine output, mentation, yeah. lactate, why is that so vital to success here? It's the only way to prevent complications. Mm -hmm. We are aiming for a kind of a Goldilocks zone of perfusion, not just pushing fluid based on a static number. If you fail to adjust the rate based on those output trends, you significantly increase risk. And finally, let's name the big one. What is a significant, often catastrophic complication that this whole conservative strategy is designed to prevent? The primary severe complication we are trying to avoid is burn-related compartment syndrome. This is a direct consequence of massive tissue edema, which comes from excessive fluid volumes. It can lead to irreversible nerve and muscle damage and often requires a fasciotomy. The modified Brook protocol's lower fluid volumes directly address this risk. So the modified Brook protocol really is a high stakes balancing act. It requires intense adherence to these specific numbers and just rigorous clinical observation. Internalizing these figures seems 
paramount. Precisely. You have to remember those two critical tracks. The protocol uses age to determine that initial resuscitation volume, right? Three milliliters versus two? Three milliliters versus two milliliters per kilogram per percent. And then it uses weight to determine your urine output goals. One milliliter versus a half. One milliliter versus 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour. Understanding and applying those dual numeric tracks is really the foundation of managing these cases properly. This entire system is built to avoid over-resuscitation, and it relies on very strict criteria to step outside that maintenance rate. This reliance on clinical judgment, it raises an important question for you, the practitioner, to think about. When you're facing a critically injured child, how precisely does your team standardize the operational definition of shock evident using mentation, vitals, and lactate to justify that one-time emergency bolus without introducing, you know, unnecessary variability from one provider to the next? Something for you to consider as you review your own protocols and training.